So yeah, so um, hi everybody. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to introduce my um, two colleagues, uh, Laura Conrad Labarento and Jennifer Hallisey from um, our Office of <clears throat> Behavioral Health within our state's uh, Medicaid program known as Mass Health. Um, for the last, I've been working with them for many, many years on um, the implementation and oversight of our um, set of services, uh, home and community-based services known as the Children's Behavioral Health Initiative. Um, some of you may know Massachusetts has had been under a um, EPSDT lawsuit for uh, and federal court monitoring for many, many years. Um, that court monitoring phase has ended, but um, as part of kind of the continued um, uh, implementation of these services, um, Jennifer and Laura have been working really closely um, with the Mass Health Managed Care entities, um, and uh, we have some funding that's um, available to us to continue to kind of support the uh, various activities <clears throat> um, with respect to implementation of the services, which includes a lot of work that they've been doing in terms of kind of the work, getting the workforce um, developed um, and getting a pipeline of folks who have been, uh, that we're looking for to get um, interested in doing kind of home and community-based work. I think we know we, we see a lot of people that are going into graduate school and are really, <laughs> interested in wanting to jump right into private practice, right? And not realizing kind of the landscape has really changed in terms of what purchasers like state mental health authorities and Medicaid agencies are purchasing these days on behalf of um, kids and families. Um, so um, I was gonna introduce each of them separately, but there's so much overlap in kind of their work, um, you know, between um, our, uh, CBHI services and Laura does a lot of work with respect to our ADA um, book of business within Mass Health as well. Um, they oversee about $470 million worth of, of, of uh, Medicaid services. Um, so I know they're going to talk today about um, some various aspects of the workforce and um, investments that we've been making in terms of licensure, reimbursement, um, um, fellowship programs, partnerships with higher education, um, and some specific kind of training investments. So um, with that, I'm not sure who's going first, Jennifer or Laura, but um, you guys can take it away. Thanks, Kelly. I think I'm going to kick it off. And um, uh, I'm Laura Conrad from Mass Health. Um, Jennifer Hallisey is here also with me from Mass Health, my um, kind of counterpart. Um, I'm going to start. Let me try to share my screen and make sure I can get this done. Uh, I think I am sharing. Is it working? Let me get the yes. full picture. You're good, Laura. Oops, wait a second. Go back, go back. I'm kind of like you, David. I think I know technology, but then, you know, not, not always. Exactly. Um, um, so I will kick it off. And uh, I mean, I hope, again, Jennifer, are new to this group, is um, if people want to raise hands daring um, and just make this kind of a discussion um, and, you know, feel free to raise a hand, speak up, ask us a question um, while we're going. Um, there's not a, you know, 35 people here. We should be able to manage that. Um, so again, Jennifer and I both work for um, the Medicaid Authority in Massachusetts. Um, we work closely with our um, mental health authority, which is Kelly English. Um, and I will say over the years, some of the workforce initiatives we have done jointly and kind of pooled our money. Um, but part of when we talk to David and part of our conversation with you, I'll move to the next slide, is um, we've really kind of thought about workforce as an incremental um, implementation, if you will, instead of all or nothing. Um, we serve for just the Medicaid authority. All of our child welfare kids receive our services. Um, it, and, and even some of the mental health, ki the kids that are our Department of Mental Health. Um, we, again, 
serve a large, you know, we serve a large portion of kids in the state, like David said, or um, earlier, Kelly, you know, annually we spend about, for Children's Behavior Health Initiatives, about $350 million just on kids services, zero to 20. So our workforce is huge, um, all the way from bachelor's level people, paraprofessionals, um, family partners, master's level people, and, um, and um, independently licensed. Um, but we have thought about it incrementally. We, um, we think about that as because we have so, so many people in the workforce and there's a lot of turnover, especially now more than ever. <laughs> um, and there's so many people coming in and out or especially in, um, and what we see too, even with our master's level clinicians is, um, you know, what they learn in graduate school isn't always applicable to who, what's happening in the community and they need some support to be able to kind of um, strengthen their skills. Um, so we offer, offer opportunities, um, you know, all the time. And in addition to that, I will say is, um, you know, with some of the opportunities that we've thought about, our, our thinking has been, if we can keep someone in the, in the workspace for another six to 12 months, that's a huge bonus for us. It helps our providers. Um, again, all these services are done um, private, by private providers, not by the state, but it helps keep, you know, it saves costs for our providers on training, um, on recruitment. So even six to 12 months, you know, length of employment and additional is a positive to us. Um, let me go to the next slide. So the, you know, one of the things that we've been doing um, I think it says here 2017, I can't even remember at this point, is, in it, and I'll say the money that we have for this is we have a bucket of money that um, we have, and it's not huge, but for the licensing reimbursement is, um, we've been doing this for about four or five years at this point, we annually, it's about $23,000. Um, we are, our staff that are master's level that are within our kids services, we have definitely the boundaries around it. We allow them to um, apply for reimbursement for licensure. Um, so that means it's up to $1,500. So that means test prep, um, test fee, licensure fee. Um, and, you know, since two th from 2017 to 2020, it's about 142 individuals. So it's, it's, not a ton of money, um, but it has helped some of our folks get independent or get li become licensed, um, at least here in Massachusetts. Um, you know, a lot of our folks that are starting out after grad school and even two years out, once they get licensed, still aren't making, you know, a ton of money. So even $1,500 isn't, um, you know, it is a decent amount of money to help them. What we do say is, um, if they apply or if we give them the $1,500, we make them, you know, again, sign an attestation, if you will, um, to give us a commitment of six months to whatever that organization or to an organization that's providing kids services. Again, not a ton of money, but a little something to help, especially when you aren't making that much money. Um, oops, I think I went too far. Jennifer, if you wanna. Sure. So can you hear me okay? One of the core services um, of the CBHI initiative is intensive care coordination, um, which is uh, sort of housed or lives within what we call a community service agency that also includes family partners. And they're delivering high, um, high fidelity wraparound um, to depending um, anywhere as upwards of 3,600 kids a year. Um, so, Sorry. So um, what we, especially in light of what's currently going on during the COVID pandemic, but even before that, that tended to be a workforce for us that we were able to retain. We held on to program directors, care coordinators, and family partners specifically a little bit longer um, than some of our other services. Um, and we really felt like the timing was right approximately three years ago to go back and um, really support the community service agencies in their new staff learning wraparound that there had as for any of you who are familiar with wraparound there can sort of be that sort of sliding from um, the fundamentals of wrap and so we um, worked with two trainers to develop um, a training for both care coordinators and family partners we have the expectation that providers have already done um, onboarding and some initial training in wraparound, but this was really meant to supplement that 
um, and to um, support staff, as you know, has already been highlighted, that with a little more support, folks may stay with us in the field a little bit longer. Um, and despite the fact that, frankly, in 20, we uh, abruptly, as many had to do, pivoted from in-person sessions to remote, um, we still kept people with us. And even um, in the course of uh, 20 to 21, had folks on waiting lists to um, enter the course. So um, really have found that to be very helpful um, in supporting that particular workforce. And again, it's uh, both for the intensive care coordinator and family partner. And we have, as the trainers, that modeled as well, someone who is an expert in care coordination and someone who's an expert in family support. Jennifer, do you want to do the IHT fellowship? Oh, sure. Sorry. So um, again, as been noted, um, we these services are the result of a class action lawsuit. Um, so something that was a big part of uh, Laura and my job was obviously monitoring for accessibility and availability of the services. So we've kind of had our eye on workforce um, for a while now anyway. Um, and so we really started to look at in-home therapy and really the need to continue to um, attract, uh, you know, young, uh, rather, clinicians um, to the service, um, but also that there was sort of a unique role here. Many aren't trained to be providing services in the youth and family's home. Um, and so really wanted to do more to support them. Again, as noted, you know, many are not making tremendous amounts of money <laughs> providing these services in the field. And so wanted to um, also highlight for um, students to be able to make a little bit of money, right? So we actually have been able to increase our stipend from, Laura, I think we started out maybe at 5,000 or $1,000 originally that first year um, with one cohort and have now in year five grown to three cohorts. Um, we do use uh, program directors of in-home therapy programs as our facilitators for these fellowships. Um, it's a fixed agenda. So all the students are receiving um, the same information in all three cohorts. We really are trying to expose uh, the students to things like what the family experience is, what the youth experience is. So we, on um, two of the sessions have uh, individuals who have received the service or who are parents um, participate um, to really lend voice to those because again um, young students who maybe have not had as much exposure to the field. Um, additionally we require that the agency supervisor uh, participate in two annual calls with our coordinators um, and we pay them a $500 stipend as well. Um, Despite the pandemic, we have still seen um, greater demand each year for the fellowship. Um, and additionally, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, we also have built in the requirement for these students to complete what we call the assessment and clinical understanding training, um, which is an online training. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So um, again, this, this is a costing us um, I see 50,000, but actually I, I, it costs us approximately $60,000 per cohort when you pay out um, the students, the supervisors, and then the facilitators of um, the sessions. So um, I'm happy to talk more about that too. But Yeah, and I'll just add too is um, starting next fall, fall of 22, um, we are expanding the number of cohorts. Um, and we are using our HCBS ARPA money to be able to do that. Cause again, that's kind of one-time funding. These cohorts change every kind of academic year cause they're students. Um, and so it's given us, so, you know, again, we're hoping to run anywhere. Well, I think we're hoping around five cohorts. We'll see um, come fall of 22. Um, and I, I will say too, the, the other thing around this is it's really helped because we market this to graduate schools and our programs market it to their interns. And so that's, it's helped us form some better relationships with, in Massachusetts, we have a lot of graduate schools. I know we're, we're very rich in that way, um, but it's marketed more than just kind of social workers. It's geared towards counseling and a lot of different people, but it's helped strengthen some of our relationships. Um, 
And again, I just want, I'm sorry, can I just yeah, add one ahead. more piece about that, which is also at the moment, we do not have this, but it's something we are considering. Um, and we've had a lot of feedback about it as well, which is to consider some kind of fellowship also for bachelor's level um, students, because again, as noted in our service delivery system, we do have paraprofessionals who are either therapeutic mentors or um, the paraprofessional on the in-home therapy team. Um, and so it is something that we're um, highly considering. Sorry, um, my technology skills, I'm skipping around, sorry. Um, <laughs> so the next um, one that we do, which kind of ties to what Jennifer just talked about, the fellowship, is our work with higher education. Um, and in Massachusetts, we are, um, um, for as small a state as we are, we are very rich in, in graduate schools and higher education. But even with us being very rich, um, we are somewhat, we, over the years, we've, we're somewhat disconnected of what's being taught in graduate schools and who those students are and, and where they're going to their internships and where they're getting employment after they graduate. So we want, um, so, you know, one of the things we launched probably three or four years ago is right before the pandemic, maybe a year before the pandemic is, um, we call them lunch and learns. At that time we call them lunch and learns. Now we call them snack of chats. Um, and it was really built on the model of kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of like pharmaceutical companies, how they go into kind of um, PCP offices and they've got 30 minutes to like spiel their product and like they bring them lunch. Um, we started doing that with graduate schools. Um, and even to bachelor's level, um, to bachelor's level schools, because again, we have a lot of paraprofessionals or people that are coming out with a BA. Um, and so we, we quickly switched over to virtual and that's why we call them snack and chats. Um, and so we have partnered with the graduate schools, I will say to make this work for us, we really, um, we partnered with someone that had knowledge of academia, higher education. Again, just I mean, so mo all, you know, a lot of state agencies, there's a lot of bureaucratic bureaucracy to state agencies and how we work, right? Um, the same exists, we have learned to higher education um, and a lot of bureaucracy and who's who and how they kind of operate. So we recruited and paid, if you will, one person to kind of get us in the doors to the schools and kind of figure out where to go to market some of this. So we, um, you know, we, it's probably about a 30, 45 minute kind of virtual meeting where, you know, bachelor's level or, you know, again, people that are graduating with a bachelor's degree or first year students or second year master students where we, we kind of talk about all of the kids behavioral health services within um, Medicaid. Um, and then we talk about some of the different job opportunities. Um, Cause I, you know, sometimes what, what we've learned is what they're learning in graduate school. And a lot of them are staying some, we do have a lot of people that come here for school and then go back to wherever, but there is a high percent that stay here. And even we talk to second year master's level students and they've never heard of some of the services that we do. Um, and we also wanted, Jennifer talked about earlier, is really kind of persuade people to do community-based work because so many of them get out and want to do kind of clinic-based work. And if you want to work with kids and families, we're kind of like, yeah, well, the best way is more home-based work than clinic-based work. So that's what we do there. The other thing that we've done and, and we're excited about is we worked with um, um, kind of some senior level people within our state. Um, and it's launching fall of 22 is we developed um, a curriculum that can be used at higher education around our kids' behavioral health system. Um, we've had one school taken on so far that will launch in 22. Um, so it really, it covers kind of one-on-one -on -one system knowledge, cultural re relevance, family engagement assessment, wraparound, crisis, um, care planning, um, and again, it didn't cost a lot. It cost us about 25,000 to develop it. Um, we've had to market it at the higher education and there definitely is a lot of bureaucracy about getting new courses introduced at higher education. But our hope is that, um, and we've tried to partner with some of the different, well, at least within our system, some of our um, staff that are program directors teach kind of ad hoc a lot at, um, um, part-time kind of faculty at a lot of the graduate schools. So we've tried to tap into those folks to be able to get this to launch. So this way it would give us, again, some of the students 
again, it's an elective course at a graduate school, but at least if they were then taking this and coming out, they would have more system knowledge and be able to hit the ground running and hopefully um, stay a little bit longer. Because sometimes we're seeing people that come out and get in the field and really have no idea what they're kind of being exposed to. Um, so that is that uh, next. Jennifer did that. Okay, so here you go. So um, just to give a backdrop, we, there are approximately 800 record reviews that are completed within in-home therapy and intensive care coordination for us annually. The majority of which is just um, a record review, but about 124 of those are also include um, interviews with the uh, primary uh, clinician, whether that's the care coordinator or the in-home therapy clinician, the family, the youth, if they, um, consent to participate. Um, and so through those record reviews, which have been going on for well over a decade, um, it became clear to us that um, there was really a need to support the assessment skills within those two services. And really thinking about that in terms of sort of that golden thread, right? A good assessment then leads to a good treatment plan, which then leads hopefully to good outcomes um, and sustainable supports. And so um, we worked with a, a vendor that we use for um, our CANS application to help us to develop a training, an online training for clinicians um, specific to youth and family supports. Um, the, we use a Moodle platform. The training sort of addresses things like um, engagement, uh, cultural relevance, child development, and then with the hopes of that leading to a really good case formulation. The training itself includes videos. We, we did, the vendor did a lot of work on um, identifying individuals who maybe were part of just generally community theater, but also had behavioral health um, support experience in the sense that they've received behavioral health supports or their family member has. So folks who really could um, really get in there and, you know, um, understand the piece of work that they were acting. Um, folks have found those videos to be extremely helpful to complementing the online um, training itself. The training is a, a little bit long. It tends to be 10 to 15 hours. And at this particular time, we have not required it of individuals. Although at this point, we have probably in three years, train somewhere close to 800 um, clinicians. There is the option to participate in what we call uh, virtual classrooms of about 20 um, students with a facilitator where there is this stop and apply. So you do the first module, there's an expectation that you then um, stop and answer several questions applying that particular um, content um, and get feedback from the facilitator as well as from other the other students who are participating. There's also the ability to go through the course independently um, as well as we have developed a supervisor's um, handbook to go along with the training so that if I was a program director and I want to take my staff through this, um, I can do that at a, you know, and self pace that to what makes sense for our particular program. So we really have tried to come at it from um, several different ways to, to help people take this up. Um, so that's, and, and that was what I was referring to when I mentioned that we expect now um, the fellowship interns to also have completed that before sort of the launch of the sessions in um, the early fall. Um, I, I, no, I was gonna say is um, for us, I'm sure like a lot of folks on the call, um, state government isn't super nimble all the time to be able to do kind of these things. So we, we did, um, you know, however many years ago, issue an RFR and kind of contract this out, out to a private vendor who manages a lot for this. And we work um, very, very closely, or Jennifer, especially Jennifer, um, you know, weekly managing this in all of the different projects. Um, it's allowed us to be able to issue those stipends. It's allowed us to kind of be more flexible because for us here, where we're at in Massachusetts, state government is not very nimble to be able to do all of this. Um, I will say is um, we, um, I'm gonna stop sharing this. Um, we here did not think um, 
one big thing was going to solve all our issues around workforce because even now what we're experiencing is we have lots of money right now which is not typical that's coming through ARPA and all that kind of thing and we can throw a ton of money at all of this but people don't have a staff and staff is turning over and staff is leaving and so what we have seen over the past we've been doing some of this for five six years is the little projects like this help sustain the workforce and keep them another six to 12 months um, make them feel like, you know, there's better morale, they feel supported. I mean, most of our workforce that are in these services are individuals that are straight out of grad school. Um, you know, they're being supervised by an independent licensed person, but again, really complex families, some of our most complex families and kids, um, and not to say least skillful, but, you know, they haven't been in the field that long, right? And so what can we do to help hold on to them, to support them, to feel like they have a community of support to connect them to each other. Um, and we've done, we didn't, we didn't post everything. We've done a lot of other training opportunities. Even with Kelly, we've done some reflective su supervision. Um, you know, we've done a lot of different things. We've done training around DC zero to five, um, ARC grow training. We've done a lot of different opportunities. We allow people to participate in and a lot of them are voluntary. Um, but it's again for their own professional development and keep some here. Again, our contract with this vendor to manage all of this is about $400,000 a year. So it's not a ton of money. Um, but again, for Medicaid, we typically don't have this kind of pot of money. Um, this is one area where the lawsuit kind of helped us um, kind of do some of this. We've heard from people, they appreciate it. Cause again, at different times too, I'll say, um, you know, we've had maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 towards the end of the year. I'm sure some of you experienced this. And we've done some opportunities where we have done some, if you will, grants. And if there's conferences that are soon or, you know, within the next couple months, we allow people apply. Again, front, outline provider, frontline providers, you know, graduate level people apply for the grants so they can go to the conferences. Because most of those folks never get any of that where they're coming from, from providers. Um, so it's little things that has really helped us um, kind of tap into them and help support them in the workforce. Uh, Jennifer, if you want to add. No, I mean, I, I think you you um, covered it, Laura. Again, you know, that this was something that was on our radar well before what is the current, you know, workforce crisis, frankly. Um, additionally, you know, we have obviously done this through MassHealth specific to the kids workforce, but you know, some of our other state agency partners who are, for instance, the Department of Public Health have also looked at this sort of fellowship specifically regarding nurses um, and some of those folks who are working more specifically in SUD um, in terms of trying to create something similar where folks feel supported. And then hopefully it's a track and a pipeline into remaining in the workforce. Because I think the other thing that I didn't mention was that we are seeing, um, that those interns who have been part of the fellowship are then um, some of those same individuals who are getting job offers from the um, site in, for continued employment. And so, you know, that's also a win for the provider because they know this level of support that the student has received, as well as, again, that they have participated in this um, pretty significant assessment and clinical understanding training. Um, and again, with the idea too, that not only are we trying to attract individuals to the workforce, to community-based work, because that's what Laura and I believe in, but also, um, you know, that we are relieving some of the burden on the provider agencies as well in terms of um, what they're needing to do in order to train and support um, incoming staff. Yeah, we've heard from some internal to our own Medicaid agency, especially the fellowship pieces, um, you know, we have lots of uh, HCBS dollars coming in. And so they're trying to look at the fellowship around some like community-based nurses, right? We're also struggling. Well, we struggle in a lot of workforce right now, I'll say that. Um, and how can we use this um, for even nursing? I will say, like Jennifer said, is initially, I think when we started this, it was a $500 stipend and we increased it to $2,500. We definitely, by increasing the stipend or offering the stipend, saw the numbers grow and it was more attractive. And again, I don't know about people here, but and I haven't been in graduate school even 10, 15, 20 years, however long ago it was, but most of our internships are not paid. 
And so even that small amount of money attracted people because that's we wanted to attract people to these providers um, to get them in the in the door um, and then offsetting again, giving their supervisors a little bit of offset of money too. Um, we, we've seen some very positive kind of impact from, from that. Laura, one other thing I just wanted to add too was in, t in terms of the lunch, like again, trying to connect things together, right? You know, that it's not just all us throwing different things at the wall was that, um, you know, we use some of our IHT fellowship graduates to then do that presentation that Laura mentioned around the lunch and learn and snack and chat so that they have the experience to actually speak to future students about this opportunity and what their experience has been much better than to Laura's point, we've both been out of graduate school over 20 years, like what the experience is. So really using their own voice. Um, Can I just add something that we're, you know, intending to do just as kind of another investment in the workforce um, development work um, is that, you know, some of the, the funds that we have um, through the block grant for um, ARPA, we're going to be making some big investments in um, helping to support providers with getting paid internships for students at the associate's bachelor's and master's degree level and also helping supervisors or agencies to help um, offset some of the costs to them for um, supervisors supervising these students. Because what we've been finding increasingly is that providers aren't interested in taking on students because they're already so overburdened and, and it becomes this, this terrible cycle. So um, that's another investment where we're planning to make is supportive internships, paid internships, because um, we also think it's a, a equity issue as well. Often the students who can least afford to do free internships, you know, um, so it's part of our um, strategy around kind of workforce diversification um, and also helping to make sure that providers have the infrastructure to actually support these students through cost offsets for supervisors or, and even as we develop this grant program that super agencies could have support part of an FTE for somebody if it's a large enough agency to do all the coordination of all of the student interns within an agency. So that's something we haven't um, quite got off the ground yet, but it's soon we'll be getting that going. And I will just add one more thing on the fellowship piece for that we do is um, it's over like I think there's six different sessions, if you will, where they come together, whether virtual or in person. Um, and it's on a day where they are at their fellowship. So instead of having them getting, you know, again, accounts, um, we do have some independent licensed people that are kind of overseeing some of this. So instead of going to their fellowship, they are coming to this kind of seminar, if you will, um, to get to, you know, again, one of the things we've heard is, um, so much of our workforce feels disconnected from each other. And so it's helped them align and have peers and kind of hear what's happening across different agencies. So um, anyway, I mean, I think we'll turn over to questions, but again, we felt small incremental approaches have really helped us um, instead of, again, one, and, and even one large thing, which I'm assuming, I shouldn't assume all of you, but like we have a lot of money right now and we're trying to put all this stuff out. And even with large buckets of money, it's just so much and so overwhelming to people that like, it's really hard, but little pockets in, and you're addressing kind of different workforce challenges. Cause it's not all the same challenge across all agencies and all different populations. So a little bit, again, I maybe take, be able to, to do, you know, a training on this you know, for a couple months, but I can't do a full year or depending on the time commitment. That's why we felt some of this um, is, has been helpful to us. Yeah, and then Laura, I'll just mention one other thing and Nilly, I think you have it to be able to provide to folks is um, just in terms of timing, you know, um, in terms of the public service loan forgiveness, we made sure to blast all of that information across our services to ensure that um, program directors and direct service staff, we have a way to get it out to direct service staff as well, had that information. Because again, some of those individuals may not have been, they may have been exempt 
previously due to whatever their repayment plan was, but now until October have the opportunity to take advantage of that. And again, really with this continued mindset of if we can get folks for another six to 12 months, then that's a win for us. And so I'm really wanting to ensure that um, folks have that information. Thank you so much. It was a lot of really fun and intriguing information. I saw Beth had asked if we would get copies of these and David's confirming again. Yes, they'll come out with the notes. Any questions that come to mind that you wanna ask while we're here? Or thoughts you wanna share from perspectives of your state? Steve, go ahead. Steve, um, I invited from our workforce team here in Washington. So thanks, Steve. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. And I uh, really appreciated the sharing and the work that you're doing. Really great relationships uh, building with the uh, education system, uh, innovative ways of thinking about retention incrementally. I think you're right on target there. Really appreciated it. I do have a couple of questions. Um, recruitment and retention are both issues in Washington for our behavioral health uh, workforce also. But um, in addition to that, we are not getting enough people into the pipeline. So I'm wondering if you are doing anything um, to reach people before they get to college uh, and, and uh, you know, encourage them to join us in this work. Steve, you know, I, I kind of, I mentioned that we have been thinking about um, specifically a fellowship for BA um, students, but you know, as we've continued to think about where are our opportunities, we have you know thought about community college and even high school students, frankly, because you know in our relationships with higher ed, we've also learned that their enrollments are down, and so we need to be really thinking about what the marketing strategy is earlier on. Um, I can't say that we have a really solid plan at the moment, but it definitely is something that we've um, definitely taken into consideration. And I think there has been great interest, again, across interagency to collaborate on doing um, that piece of work. So um, maybe next year I'll have more to say <laughs> about that. Jennifer, I know that, you know, as part of some of the HCBS money that is coming in, that there's going to be a big kind of effort around kind of a call to care campaign um, that the state is kind of going to be rolling out in terms of kind of helping people um, know more about kind of what are the jobs that are out there and available. So it's going to be kind of a big social media kind of big campaign that's going to be done across the state to kind of um, be one piece of a strategy around um, pipeline. And I'll say, Steve, Jennifer, so what, one of the things that we talked about is not only high schools, at least in Massachusetts, um, and again, another area where we're a little rich in, is we have a lot of vocational schools here that are part of our public school system, and is how are we better, one of the conversations we've had is how are we better tapping into them, because, you know, they have nursing programs, they have all kinds of different programs at the voc schools, and how are we, um, getting aligned with them and like they do co-ops here our our, our voc students are doing co-ops and so how are we getting better aligned to them and one of the other things too that we're in this state with some of the money um is we and with our disrupt money actually we actually which i didn't put it on there is um we have i hate to say scholarships but basically um for master's level and bachelor's level people you know folks that we're giving twenty five thousand dollars a year to um, and so how are we kind of marketing that before you get into school so that it may drive you to school that knowing that you're gonna get this $25,000 to help pay for your education. Yeah, two, two quick questions and I don't wanna dominate all the time. So I'll throw them out there if you, if you have time to answer them. I'm wondering if through this process, you've uh, done, you've made any changes to the way you're contracting. Uh, you mentioned several times that we've, we've got a ton of money coming out into our communities and, uh, and in some ways it exacerbates the workforce challenges because we just don't have the people to serve them. So I'm wondering if you've thought differently about how you contract to help build infrastructure for workforce. And then secondly, you talked a little bit about uh, diversity. I'm wondering if, 
um, you know, uh, education is a privileged system. And so I'm wondering if you are seeing more return on investment from, um, you know, from diversity efforts and in, in some of your offerings. Thank you for so your So I can speak to the first one. So with our, um, our kids behavioral health system is part of um, our home and community-based services. Um, so there was a lot of HCBS Again, there's a lot of ARPA money out there, right? But there's different buckets of ARPA money. So this is part of HCBS ARPA money. And one of the things we did is, you know, we gave rate, and cross, rate increases across the board, right? To everybody. But we put some stipulations around it, actually, that 90% of the rate increase had to go to frontline staff or direct care staff, that it could not go to administration. Um, and, and we put some stipulations around what that could look like, again, for recruitment, retention bonuses, again, because it's one-time money, so it's hard to raise salaries, but ultimately, organizations have to decide what they're going to do with it. It could go to training. Um, we do are asking for attestations for, you know, again, uh, uh, saying that 90% of the money, and we're asking, we will be asking come end of December for spending plans, again, um, for spending plans, but it is, um, so it, it is, I think, because a lot of times we give money and so what organizations do with them, you don't, you just don't know, right? And there's been a lot of questions about where all this money is going. And so, but we did put stipulations that 90% had to go to the frontline staff and to the services that were part of the category, if you will, the HCBS. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, you want to talk about the diversity or, I mean, I think in the diversity area, I mean, Jennifer, you know, we've done some training opportunities, I will say, um, over the years. Um, I think this is an area, well, and I'll say we are trying to um, expand the fellowship to certain areas and certain schools. I mean, I think it is an area where we could be stronger in and do some more work. I'll just be very transparent about, about that. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to add no, I mean, I think you've covered, I mean, we have, um, again, we put out offerings, we don't necessarily require, it's always the balance we're making in terms of the way our services are reimbursed and our, um, our staff are employed. So um, I think that that is, has been um, some of the work we have, we have done some, some work around this, but to Laura's point, we, we need to do a better job, frankly, than we do right now. Um, Thank you very much um, for all of your time and for sharing your contact information on the slides. I suspect there will be some follow-up questions um, happening from this conversation. I really appreciate you being here today.